All right, friends. Uh, I think get started. Thank you for coming to yet another Chai and Why. This is thank you. Uh, so, as you know, Chai and Why, in case you're coming for the first time, happens 
on the first Sunday over here at Prithvi Theatre, on the third Sunday at Ruparel College in Matunga, and if a month has a fifth Sunday, it happens at Alexandra School in Fort. So possibly, usually do, sometimes maybe three sessions a month. Uh, the best place to find out is Facebook. If you want to be on our mailing list, send an email to outreach at TIFR. So before we start, let me just tell you about the next two events coming up. Uh, one is uh, the next two weeks from now, December 20th, uh, we are going to discuss geometries, but not the typical geometry where the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees, but different kinds of geometry uh, which find their way in many places in physics and mathematics and in knitting sweaters. So uh, uh, that's going to be two weeks from today. And then uh, in January, we will begin our 8th year of Chai and Y. And uh, I will talk about something. Uh, we've just completed 50 years of Moore's Law. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Moore's Law. This is, you've heard of Moore's Law? OK, very good. No, a question. Yeah. In the geometry Chai and Y, why are you not doing Euclidean geometry? Well, I want a home assignment for that from my class. <laughs> oh, you got a home assignment. <laughs> so that you think about. So we will talk about something which is more fun than... Assignments are boring, no? <laughs> Not for my class. Okay, so we will talk about something that's great fun. Okay, so you run, and the best part is there will be no home assignments about this. So it's even nicer. <laughs> okay, the first Sunday of January we will talk about Moore's Law. This is the thing that transistors have gotten smaller and smaller over the last 50 years and we've been able to pack billions of them into a chip that gives us all the power of computing that we have today and this has completely changed the world and it is just unimaginable the progress that has been made in this area uh, which has enabled the internet and everything else if it wouldn't have happened without if Moore's Law wasn't there. So that's what's going to happen uh, the first Sunday of January. And please remember to check out facebook.com slash uh, like us and you'll hopefully get updates and you can see, you can ask questions, you can post things, um, it's fun. Okay, so that was the next few programs and while we interchange, I'd like to thank you all for also being part of an experiment which happened while you are entered. Uh, so some of you probably realize that you are part of an experiment, if not you will see the results of the experiment very soon, but uh, it's time to introduce... Um, our speaker for today, uh, Professor Sankhya Koshika. Uh, she is a neurobiologist at TIFR and uh, she started off in Chennai, went to Brandeis for a PhD, uh, Washington University for a postdoc, uh, joined the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore and eventually uh, landed up at TIFR where she works with tiny worms and she'll tell you more about it. She's also got the Howard Hughes Early Career Fellowship award something. Uh, Sandhya can tell you more about what she does. Um, but today she's going to talk, tell us about traffic jams which in the brain. Uh, so hopefully you didn't encounter too many while coming here. Uh, no mega blocks. But Sandhya all yours. The scientist is inaccurate. I didn't start my life in Chennai. But aside from that, it's a privilege really to speak at this location where I've only been in the audience. So it's really nice. And what I'm trying to do today is to convey some of the work that we are doing in our, in our lab in a more Amar Chitrakata style or show and tell style. And I hope it inspires some of you to start thinking about the brain and the nervous system. This has really been a passion of mine for, for now or decades. So, the major question that all scientists are interested in when they get all get get started in science is really the why question. Why does something happen the way it does? Why is the world the way it is? Can we understand something about it? But in terms of our operational lives as scientists, we spend most of our time working on the how question. And the how question is, of course, predicated by the why question. And in my case, if I had to ask all of you who are here today giving up a few precious hours on a Sunday, is can you tell me why might it be important to study the brain? Why might it be important to study the brain? Make it work better. Discover the way it works. And why is that important to see? Okay, so one goal is to understand mankind.
to control. So you want to understand what controls your internal weather? Not to replicate it. So nothing we have is, sorry, sorry, yes. So that you can develop new genetic theories and if you know how the brain works then perhaps you can cover all two Several, several interesting ideas. So, and in fact, that is precisely what happens, right? So, I think we want to all understand ourselves and the world around us and our place in it. And that was one answer. You know, I want to understand how the, our internal weather is controlled, where our emotions and thoughts and feelings come from. Is there disease? New genetic theories, I mean, the theories are in place to try to understand the world around us. But if you sort of break it down, what does our brain help us do? What do we as living organisms do? We look at this world around us, we sense it, we think about a way to interact with it, and then we act upon it. So, if you think about it in absolute terms, there's perception. There's thought about what you have perceived and then there's action, right? So, for instance, you see a dog, you first recognize that it's a dog. That's important. Then, this dog doesn't have such an expression, but you could have a dog which looks at you very beseechingly asking it to feed me. So, then you recognize that the dog wants to be fed. You might be enjoying a cup of orange juice with your morning newspaper and wishing that I would much rather have a good cup of coffee. At least that applies to me. You might enjoy a wonderful sunrise and you might say, you know, I really need to get exercise and I wish I was like a very good cyclist and get on it. Right? So these are the various aspects that your brain controls. Alternately, just as this kid said, did you have a question? Yes, it does. But all life doesn't need brain. Right? There can be many types of life forms. Not all of it needs to be coordinated by a brain. We give an example of a heart which has an internal electrical circuitry which also controls the rate at which it. Plants don't have brain. We wouldn't be alive without plants. So the other major motivation that many people have in thinking about the brain is really looking at injury and disease, right? Here is a picture of someone who is a very famous baseball player called Lou Gehrig and he got a disease called Lou Gehrig's disease which essentially ended up in him being stuck in a wheelchair for a very long time and then losing his life, right? So you have many kinds of neurodegenerative diseases. Nearly all of you would have heard about dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And it's a growing public health problem. One, if we could help solve or at least mitigate, can have tremendous benefits. But I think something more curiosity driven is throughout history we've been inspired by what we see around nature. Leonardo da Vinci, two right brothers, inspired by flight. Can you come up with a way to move? And that is looking at the skill set of the nervous system as it executes itself in various kinds of animal life forms. Okay? So these are all the various situations that we might want to look at the brain. When you start, just, you know, everybody has at some point in their life seen a brain. And right here is a picture of how the human brain looks like. And the human brain, aside from controlling perception, thought and action, also controls things like memory, which is lost when you have, you know, disease-like situations like Alzheimer's. So you can take that brain, cut it into half, and that's what you see at part of it. And in fact, the classic division of labor that you see in many, many contexts in biology, where different parts of the brain control different aspects of behavior. I think kind of thing. This is a place where you can smell, and you know, parts of your brain which can you know understand smell. This is a place where you store your memory, and that's the little region where you store your memory. You blow that up, and you see all these, you know, thread-like structures, and you blow that up some more, and you see that it's filled with cells, and one of the major cells over there is called a neuron, and here you see a neuron with its many, many, many filamentous things that come from it. Essentially, it's, 
it's like a tree. Okay, a tree which has many branches and it reaches out and senses a lot of things in its environment and gives information out. Right? So that's how the neuron is laid out. Yes. So if you think, you just think about what I said in the beginning that the the neuron, the nervous system perceives, it thinks about it, and there's an output, an action. So if you think of it as individuals, my God, there's a tiger in front of me. I better run from it, and then you run from it, right? If you break that down into its units, then there is somewhere a small little cell. Somewhere a small little cell which is taking the same kind of decision. That means it needs to perceive information that comes through dendrites. The cell sort of thinks about whether it needs to respond to that information or not. That happens mostly in the cell, in that big thing in the center. Yeah? And then it says, oh, I must do something about it. And then there's this process which comes and says, does something about it and communicates with another cell. In fact, almost all of you, sometime in your school life, have seen such a picture. This is the reflect action picture. Nearly everybody has seen it. Is there anybody who hasn't? No. Right? Everybody has seen the reflect action picture. Where if you... She has tested your reflexes. And what he... Okay, what did he do? <laughs> I'm sure they were working. You just probably he didn't hit hard enough. But you must have. You must have had this experience where you hit yourself or you stubbed your big toe against some big thing. Have you? Sometimes. What do you do? You remove your leg, don't you? If you're going to go and burn your finger in a candle, what do you do? Diwali just went by, right? Never done that. Oh, right. <laughs> when I was a kid, I burnt my finger just to see what happened. I was very dumb. I realized that afterwards. But I was so embarrassed to my mom after that. Right? So we all have these defense mechanisms. It's essentially a way to not allow us to injure ourselves. You go somewhere, you hit yourself, you withdraw. You withdraw your toe if you hit yourself against an obstacle, which is, you know, right here. If I hit myself against this table or if you're getting burnt and you're in very close, you remove your hand, right? And these are reflex actions and often very, like, you can override reflex actions, but reflex actions in place receive information, think about it, and put out an output. And usually an output where you move somewhere. Okay? So neurons talk to each other. Clear. It's not the same cell. Neuron is a cell. A cell is a unit I think many of you have heard about. Looking at the sophistication of the questions and getting here, I think many of you know what a cell is. A neuron is a cell, and the cell communicates with other cells. These other cells can be other neurons. This is what I call thinking. You know, they think about whether they're going to respond or not. And you have output neurons that they connect to, telling you to respond to start moving. And therefore, this neuron can also talk to another muscle. Right? So this is the circuit. That means neurons talk to each other. This is we talk to each other and talk to other cells like muscles, allowing you to carry out motion. So how do they talk to each other? And the way they talk to each other is using something which I'm going to generically call as cargo. Okay? And it occurs at specific locations in the neuron. So here is a neuron without its, you know, without any really major dendritic arbor, which you talked about, you have a cell body. You have a path, which is often called the axon, and I will often call it the path. And you have a structure over here through which it talks to other cells, be they other neurons or muscles. And these are filled, this is electron micrograph of one such structure, and they are filled with a lot of stuff. These are different types of cargoes. Here we are showing you one type of cargo, and here is my attempt at doing a PowerPoint tracing of it. And what's present in this cargo is essential to allow the cell to talk. So if you're thinking about this kind of cell, 
So this part of the cell is talking, this uh, part of the cell is thinking and telling whether you need to talk. There needs to be communication between these two ends. So some of the ideas that exist are the following. Okay? That you can make a lot of cargo over here and somehow carry them over to the area which is called the synapse where you talk to another cell. There is an alternate hypothesis, right? You could make things over here and forget about the cell bond. You could. That does not seem to be the way it happens. Most of the synthesis of cargo takes place in the cell body and the idea is that this cargo shows up here because of some mysterious process. Much like what happens with our vegetables and produce which is grown in the outskirts in large farms and then transported to intensely crowded smaller locations like cities. Smaller in area, not in the number of human beings which is grown. Okay, so that analogy is a better analogy in this case, rather than making and consuming right at this location. So when this hypothesis was instituted, people wanted to figure out whether there was flow of material from where they thought it was being made to where they thought it was being used. Can you think of a way we could test this idea? Since many of you seem to be Chi and Y regular. It's a very simple idea. Something is moving from one place to another. You want to just your idea that it's moving, your hypothesis that you're moving from one place to another. How might you find that out? If that's true or false. Someone needs a chance. <laughs> we can numb the brain and, and uh, do the simulation. If it doesn't work, then we, show, we see that that part is connected to this. You want to numb it. Yeah, so, so temporarily we you know don't allow that part to work. One of the parts, I think. Then then you know do the same thing. Block the parts. If you block the part and it doesn't appear on the other side. Exactly. It's a very simple idea. You said numb it and people did exactly that. And those were the first set of experiments. And I must tell you that some of the early neurobiological research which is done in this area was directly in result to some of the horrific injuries that you saw in World War II. We fortunately more or less live in times of peace. I mean the parts of the world which are not so, but we still live more or less in times of peace where we can en engage in very interesting activities like, you know, reading about science and watching YouTube videos. But it has not always been the case and in World War II, there were large number of plane crashes and people in their prime of life had severe spinal cord injuries. And you know the spinal cord is filled with nerves. So people had a lot of interest in neurons and how these neurons work. Can we do something to help these people who are in their late teens and early 20s? Because the rest of their life is, you know, not like a normal human being anymore, right? And they're very young and they're going to live for very many years and you want to give them quality of life. So those were the kinds of things which inspired people to start looking at this part which connects the cell body to the place where it communicates with other cells. And indeed your ideas were right. You numb it. Or you temporarily block it. Very simple garden hose analogy, right? You have a garden hose, you seal it on, you know, you have flow from one idea and you seal the other end so the water is not flowing out and you tie a little knot around it or you can use a little bit of ice in that location and slow everything down. And what you see over a period of weeks, okay, it doesn't happen in a day or two, you would see that this neuron sort of swells up both when it's coming from here where you make cargo as well as here where you use cargo. So you know that material is flowing in both directions. Alright? And that's a very powerful concept because it immediately says that your hypothesis that things are made in one location and carried to another location is certainly the potential hypothesis to explain how this cell, this cell behaves rather than making everything local. Okay? So you are you're looking at a you're looking at a model of a cell as a city as a model as pastoral agriculturist in Stone Age, not Stone Age, you know, Mesopotamia. Right? So you immediately are able to distinguish between these two two potential hypotheses in a very simple manner. Alright? So that is sort of what 
Looking at these early studies is what led to the first recognition that you had flow of carpo taking place in this direction. Okay, you didn't understand the experiment? Okay, the experiment is very simple. Think about it as a garden hose, as I said, right? You have a tap which is open slowly and you sort of feel the end of the garden hose. Okay, so you don't have water flowing out. Haven't yet thought of a better analogy which might help you understand it better. So we'll have to go with the garden hose analogy. Now, you can't see the tap. You can see only the middle. When you are seeing only the middle, you don't know whether something is flowing or everything is at a standstill. How will you figure it out? You can do that in part by tying a knot. Right? From the tap where water is flowing, up until the knot, it will fill up the hose if it has some ability to flex. If it's very hard, then you won't see it. For instance, what happens in the cold in the US? The water at certain places freezes. And the purse, the pipe near that swell up and burst, right? So much like that, you're trying to figure out where things move from by doing this small perturbation. Uh, what is, what do you mean by cargo? Cargo is various kinds of organelles, the technical term. There would be organelles like, some of you would have heard of things like mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. And those little circles that we call, saw in that electron micrograph, which contain chemicals which allow one neuron to talk to another. Those chemicals are called neurotransmitters. These are all these types of different parts. Neurotransmitters just manufactured in the near the synapse. Um, some of them are amino acids which go into form into proteins, so they are present everywhere. But they are certainly filled into these different small vesicles. We don't yet know where they are filled. They are certainly filled there, but they could be filled under. So that is regulated release. No, that is release of cargo at the synapse. The flow is not dependent on calcium. The flow is something that happens all the time. You, you know, if the analogy between a farm and a city really holds true, right? When you have farms and you have cities, you constantly, unless there is a road, roko andolan, there is flow of cargo in both directions. From city, no, there's mitochondria, there's many, 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 many types of cargo. Okay, so you have flow of information and organelles from the cell body to right up to where the cargo will be used and back What role does the sodium channels and sodium potassium channels which are there, uh -huh. which actually take the signal? Is that so though that electrical signal occurs in the time scale of seconds and sometimes minutes. What we are talking about is something that takes days to take place, right? So the garden hose experiment again told you that it took days for that swelling to develop. But if, so you, you're talking about completely different time scales. My ability to move my hands in this very quick manner depends on those sodium and potassium channels, but my ability to maintain those structures depends on having this flow. And this flow is called axonal transport. Okay, so I'm going to show you a simple example where you take a neuron, you peel off its cell membrane. Basically, you peel off the skin and see what's happening inside using a microscope. So it's a very, very old, some of the early experiments which were done, and you can see my attribution. It comes, these come from the Vale lab. All right, these are the different types of cargo. There's a mitochondria, there's a little spherical cargo. You can see they move, they stop, here's a clump of them, one just broke away and went somewhere right? and it's going to loop, here seems to be a collection of cargoes over here, they move forwards and backwards, here's where one is turned. So that's what's happening inside your and mine and every animal which has a nervous system is neuron. So when you look, when you looked at this movie, and I've described the process as it is, do you perceive that there could be any challenges for an organism or for the neuron that it needs to solve? 
the two or three different things and we'll discuss one of them. So this looks like as if it's moving randomly. No, it isn't actually. So but it looks like as, as if... Yeah. That's a very good point. So if you look at any given time, and I'll show you one more movie. If you look at any given time, you will find that cargo seems to sort of decide whether it's going to go ahead, not go ahead, it's going to stop. But if you look over a period of time, which is why that garden hose experiment, that analogy of, you know, doing a ligation experiment on the neuron is so important. It tells you that there is directional flow taking place. It's just that instantaneously, like this in microscope, you are not able to capture it unless you watch it for a long time. So, so you have to look for a trend or pattern? You have to look for a pattern over days. But that's not true for every case. In this case, in this particular experiment, what they are looking at, you can see that. I'll show you an example where we look at a cargo a little later on, where it moves largely. You can see that in the time of moving, it moves very smoothly in both directions. What drives this uh, thing? What, is, what makes it go from A to B? Yeah, so that I was going to do if there was interest in the end. So the, the engines for motion are called molecular motors. They are essentially motors. They use energy and move cargo in both directions. Okay, he actually identified one of the problems that you have. How do you make sure that you get cargo from point A, which is the cell body, right, where you have it generated, to point B, which is where you're going to use it? That's very important. Similarly, you can say the other side of the problem, how do you take things from the synapse, which is where you're using this cargo largely, back to the cell body, right? This is one set of questions and challenges that the cell has to solve. The second set of questions the cell has to solve any cost. How to change the direction of that? How to regulate the flow? I mean, if it is not uh, not working as per requirement, there's a disability or something. So how to? That's a very good point. But I want you to think about the animal kingdom. What do you see? Have you, what is the smallest animal anybody has seen? The smallest animal living. <coughs> is a rat. What's the biggest animal you have seen? A giraffe, right? The blue whale. They all have neurons? Yes. Yes? What would be the size of the neuron in a rat? Limited by the size of the rat? Yes, you do have a neuron sticking out of the rat. I hope not. <laughs> that would be scary. <laughs> no, the is we took care of more processes or something. That's why the neurons are bigger or they are more open. Well, they, so bigger is probably not the right way to describe them. But what you see in two animal kingdoms is that organisms come in different sizes but still execute equally complex behavior. Dolphins, for instance, speak to each other, right? So they are able to perceive their environment and communicate with each other. The neurons in a dolphin are going to be a different length than the neurons in a rat, right? So one of the things that you see, even in a simple organism like us, one of the biggest challenges of the nervous system is the length of the cell. An ordinary cell would have a 50 micron diameter or slightly smaller. Right? Or normal cell. In fact, none of you have probably seen a cell by yourself. So we know that you it's an act of faith that you there are your you know skin is made up of cells, whatever, but you haven't seen a cell with your naked eye. But the cells that you can see with your naked eye, and if you've ever done any biology dissection, is, is yes, you can see an egg, but you can also see neurons. Yes, but you can also see neurons. Right? I'm just talking about yourself. You can't you can't see your mom's egg. So <laughs> you can see a chicken egg, but you can see neurons. They are extremely long cells. That means that cargo needs to be moved over great distances. And that becomes a problem. You can you can see a neuron of a earthworm. Blue whale. Probably the longest cell in any organism. The longest cell typically in any organism is a neuron. 
I didn't say the largest, but the longest cell typically in any organism is a neuron. Because it's the longest. For instance, for me, the longest cell is about a meter long. It runs from my spine up to my big toe. The same big toe probably no sportsman wants to stub because then they can't score run. Alright? So how do you cover that distance? One question was directionality, which is what he raised. You know, how do you get from point A to point B? And the question was regulation. But you have to cover that distance. How do you cover distance taking cargo from one place to the other place, destination A to, de you know, place A to destination B? And what the cell has invented is using tracks. These tracks are called multitudes. And it is along these tracks that cargo are moved. Okay. Yeah, this is little, it's like roads of the cell. These are the big cellular roads or highways where things are moved. And I'm going to show you here, I hope I'm going to show you here an example of how cargo moves on track. Okay. It hopefully will loop. These are the tracks, complete same lab, where you have these little cargoes moving. There's one. Here's the other. Let's okay, move along. And if it loops, I'll show you that when a car comes to the end of its road, it has no way to go. Let's see if I can find an example. There's one right here and I sort of missed it. Okay. What's something here? You have one here, come to its end, and there's no way for it to go. You also see occasionally if cargo just stop, even as though they are on the track. So often you'll come to the end of the track when there's no road for it to walk on. Of course, cargo can't go anywhere. But sometimes they can stall in the middle. What's okay. the source of energy for this movie? ATP. Uh, and is this video real time or is it sped up? It's a little bit sped up. The first video was sort of real time. The first video that I showed you. That seemed like everything happening so slowly, but that's the information you to get. That's why I said there are two time scales. One time scale is for quicker things that you want to do. You stubbed your toe and you want to run away. You're burning yourself and you want to withdraw. All of that occurs fast. That does that is carried by electrical signals. No way if this process is going to support that. But you need to maintain those structures. You need to keep those structures working over long periods of time. So then you have something which occurs at a different time scale, which takes maybe longer, it can still get the job done. How does the cell body ensure that uh, the entire cargo that's fast has reached the destination? Or it doesn't <laughs> care? Of course it cares. It must care. You're absolutely you're right. It bloody frustrates me. What, this is what I think of as a counting problem. Okay. So how do you know that you've got enough of something? It is so far away, a meter away, not the foggiest idea. Yeah, that is how, uh, for example, when networks uh, check two computers communicate, there is a way in which you, there is an error correction mechanism that I can actually have. So is there some kind of an inbuilt error correction mechanism so that, for example, A does not become B and then my hand does something else? I don't know if you need an error correction mechanism. Think about it, think about it like tomatoes and potatoes. You know, it's like you need so much of some of these things that the synapse case, though potato, agate, tomato, something will not go wrong. That's what I think, but I don't know if it's true. See, I am dispatching <coughs> 10 tons of tomatoes to the city. Hmm. Like in return potential moment, I am asking for 10,000 kilos. Or better still, I am taking garbage from them. Hmm. Okay, so I need to know that my customer out there has I agree. So that's what I said. That's what I think of classically as a counting problem. And there is, I haven't the foggiest, nobody has the foggiest book in how it works. Very, very interesting question. This all uh, highway or roads are within the neurons or no? No, 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 no. Because they're inside the neurons, right? So these, each little highway, each little thread, each little track, and you can see that some of them are short, which is why they come to the end of it. They're not as long as neurons. So the way this prep is done is you remove this cover of the neuron, you squeeze out the astroplasm, and then you just sort of spread it around. 
Okay, so they have been spread. Usually they are lined up very nicely, like I showed you in the schematic. These roads are within the neuron. Within the neuron and they are shorter than the length of the neuron, of course. And there are multiple ones of them. And they are dynamically getting created. That also happens, but largely they are quite stable. In neurons they are quite stable. And these are ready highways or? Ready highways. Ready highways. All set to go and work. Seem to be going over. They don't seem to be still lying. Up. I'm sorry. So this is that's why I said this is a dissociated preparation where the axon has been spread, so you can't see that. I'll show you a very nice movie later on which says that. Yes. The cell makes it. It's made of essentially two types of proteins which are stuck together. Okay. So just as when you make a pavement, you have these multiple tiles and you put them together. So these two are like these two proteins which are like tiles next to each other, stuck to each other. Yes. Do we see any problem, probability distribution function uh, from one, one side to another, another? Like, do we have, uh, like, uh, the, I, I suppose I send 10 terms of my cargo from my point to another, but uh, I, I want to make sure that I, I only need 8,000. So there will be probability that. 20% of that will So, as I said, there isn't still, I don't, nobody knows how things are counted and how they count, whether you have got enough in the first place. But there's certainly mechanisms suggested where, you know, if you're using 10 tons and you need your 11 ton based on something, then you can get that 11 ton. And that signal tells you to bring that 11 ton. Okay. But in the first place, how do you decide that you get 10 tons? Not 11, not 12. Or eight, don't know. Particularly, I think it, it sends more than what is necessary. That would be that would be consistent with all of the areas in biology. You always have vast excess, and then you know, yes. And in fact, one of the things this is certainly one of the ideas is that that's why neurodegenerative diseases, which start by aberrations in transport, or neurodegenerative diseases that influence transport, in both of those cases, your disease starts. Progress is very slowly and before you, you get that full fledged it's really terrible aspect of the disease, more than a decade has gone by. So is that a reason why, you know, like something is hurting me and if I'm, you know, concentrating on that, it, it seems to be amplifying the pain and if I, you know, avoid it or I, I... That is a different mechanism. That's nothing to do with transport. That is called attention. So if you have... If you turn your attention away, you can distract yourself. You know, it's like supposing you're trying to study something which is sort of dry and you have some interesting things playing on your computer, you're drawn to it. Or you see something beautiful outside, you're drawn to it. Or even something you just interesting. That's because your mind shifts attention. That's a very different thing. And that, that for these, those kinds of processes, that's higher brain processing where you have networks of neurons taking those decisions. Okay, that is not at the level of individual neurons. What I'm describing to you are processes that occur at the level of individual neurons. That does not mean they don't have, just as I said, the 10th, the 11th truck, that 11th stun that comes in depends on the ability of the neuron to communicate with another cell. Sorry, I will proceed. If the questions are immediately relevant to the slide, let's yeah. do it. If not, we have an hour plus for discussion. Okay. Yeah. So, what is the milieu of the neuron where things are moving? And actually when you peel back the cell membrane and you look inside it, these are the different types of cargoes which you've already seen in movies. You've seen small cargoes, medium sized cargoes, these very long cargoes. And this is this mess of roads and other kinds of materials which is present inside the neuron. And what is the first thought that comes to you when you see something like this? <laughs> Then it's inside your cell <laughs> Crowded. At least that's what comes to me. It's very crowded. It's very messy. And there is a lot of stuff over there. So how do you get this kind of motion that you see that I showed you? Like the previous movie I showed you, you see the things were really moving very freely. Right? So cells inside neurons, you have this very crowded milieu present. And in fact, Many obstacles are in place. For instance, if you look, this is a this is a neuron, okay, here. This is a reconstruction of a real neuron done by the Goodman lab. And you make a section over here and you look at it face on. And you see all of these little filamentous structures. I think of these filamentous structures as street vendors who block major roads in our city. Right? They just come, sit there and they want to sell their potatoes and tomatoes and chapel repair and whatever else. Very useful for us. 
and they're gone as a pain, but they're all present blocking the road. Right? So you have many, many, many obstacles in the path. So that's what I'm trying to say over here with this particular picture. And in addition, the transport path may be narrow. Here is a series of on-face sections like I showed you in the previous slide looking through the neuron. And what you see is here you have a little bit of space. Here there is hardly any space compared to that. And this happens, especially in Indian roads, it happens. Suddenly it will be broad because those people, there were no houses over there. And this major, you know, major road will suddenly become very narrow because there are houses and shops and everything, right? So you have this kind of... Another analogy to use is the overhead analogy. If every, if, if, if the heights of, if all of our roads were particular, were tunnels, then only one size of truck could go through, right? At most. You can get something smaller, but you couldn't get something bigger. But here, because it's variable, it's in, immediately more interesting and more challenging. Okay? So this is the second set of challenges that the cell needs to cell faces. Yes? These are those roads. These are roads. Yeah, those are the roads. Those are those little tracks that you saw along which cargo was moving. But between these two tracks, nothing can move. So you'll only be able to use these because that space is very small. So essentially, you're looking at only how much space is available to move. What is one of the five and the middle? What do you think will happen? One of the, it will stop, no? Yeah, and the will there or? Well, unless it can shift to another road. The roads are, the keep on, the roads keep on building, new roads are keep, uh, Mostly they are stable, in neurons they are mostly stable, but a few are certainly rebuilt. Exactly like we see in our city, roads are stable and they are rebuilt, they sometimes also repaired. Okay, are so, uh, directly, not that we know of. Like one road connecting with another. No, not directly physically connected that we know of. There is at least one study which suggests that that might happen. Yeah, but you don't, right? You're covered with those motors. You can fall off and attach them there. Ah, so these are very, these roads are very stiff polymers. So if you had one stiff polymer through your entire neuron, you couldn't even bend your leg. I mean, you didn't have to. You just couldn't bend. They are very stiff polymers, so you have multiple tiny, tiny little pieces, which allows your neuron to be flexible. Ma'am, in case of bulk transport, does the size of the neuron expand? Only when you do the ligation. But the neuron diameter itself, that's what I gave you the analogy, two analogies. What happens with the foot when it constricts and expands, right? Which is not quite the best analogy. The better analogy is the overhead pass analogy, where you say that, you know, your overhead pass at a certain point limits what can go through, right? So you can have a narrow space, like the bottom of this place, or a slightly wider space. Right? And so, finally, so I said, I said three types of obstacles to movement. You have street vendors, you have the overhead path, and you have the end of the road. But the saving grace is, and the saving grace for us as well is, it's not uniform. And here's a picture which comes from another lab, where it shows that these kind of street vendors, which is marked in green, are present not everywhere, but at certain locations. Therefore, you have some free space and some constrained space. And if you look at, again, cutting a bundle of nerves, you see that all of them are not equally crowded. So you have regions where you can move freely, and you have regions where you can move less freely. I think all, I was going to solicit what are the kinds of questions that you can address when you've seen the description of what are the challenges the neuron faces. Would you, anybody like to, I mean, you've all raised very interesting points. Would you like to? Add something to what are the questions that you might be interested in studying? Uh, what I was noticing, I don't know, I've stepped in late, I'm sorry, so maybe you'll cover it, but I noticed that on each of the tracks, all the traffic was moving only in one direction. Is there. <coughs> that, in that particular experiment, yes. 
but it actually can move in both directions on the same it can move in both directions on the same track the road is a road the road doesn't the road might have preferences and that has been part of as a road cam have preferences or something but it doesn't exclude yes that's because they use a particular kind of motor oh. Coming there, yes, coming there. Or oh, you have anything to ask? Yes. <laughs> so the rivers can communicate with each other using radio waves or something. No, not radio waves. Use chemicals called neurotransmitters. But how do they work? Neurotransmitters are little chemicals when they are released from one neuron. they recognized by the other cell and then the cell says oh i got some neurotransmitter i need to do something about it they use something called the motors force. okay so the they force is generated between sodium and potassium that is yes that's important but that is not the neurotransmitter that we're talking about that electrical energy electrical force leads to release of neurotransmitter so we we saw the individual neurons working right? so how all of them are connected in a network and how they get poorer regulated so like poor so i think maybe this we can discuss later so let me get through my talk since i'm not said that so some of the questions that you can think of looking at here is how do cargo move through crowded regions right this ununiform crowded regions where you know they might have a solution in one location which may or may not work in another location how are transport pathways in general regulated in fact somebody raised this and finally if you're a human being with aging great grandmothers and fathers what are the pathologies associated with this pulse transport pathways and can you do something about it these are some of the questions that one can think of there are large number okay so we sort of set up the problem and when you try to have a biological question you have to think about good experiments which will give you clear answers anybody can do an experiment but a good experiment is very different from just an experiment because a good experiment attempts to give you an answer to the question that you are raising it's up to them okay do people want to try break I have about twenty one. I have. I am now at twenty one, and I have ten slides. I I leave that to you. You are the flow manager here. or we can take a poll it's up to you sorry i i yeah and we did an experiment with all of you my students did so that's the first experiment is one okay okay so when you think of a question you want to understand how you address it and the way I address it with my students in my lab. Is to use a simple little nematode, a soil worm, which is much, 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 much smaller than an earthworm. It's only one millimeter long. It's called C. elegans, and it is transparent, so you can see through it. And it has many tools that we can use. Okay, so I won't describe all of those today. What you do? Yeah, ah yes, we, uh, one of our demonstrations is the experiment that was done. Another is a visual small skit to show you all of these concepts that I have been discussing through my talk. And finally, we have some more to show you. So, those of you who have the patience to stay with me, you know, and the time, <laughs> you may have the patience. You can enjoy all of this. And so, what you do is very simple, right? And I'm I'm not going to ask you questions anymore because I guess we will have very cold child and it's no fun at all. is you take these various cargo and essentially you label them so supposing you are standing you know if you're going in an aeroplane very high in the sky and you have to give me a rickshaw what would you let me attach a giant thing which is very big or very bright which i can see from the plane 
and it marks all auto rickshaws and essentially that's what you do you take something you mark one cargo usually you mark it with something which is fluorescent which shows up either in our microscope as green or red in color and here i'm going to show it as a black and white image here's a worm moving around these are the synapses where it talks to other cells and you can see that they have this color and i need to say it again i'm sorry the worm is not moved out of the way and that's the brain of the worm such as it <laughs> all right so how do you and if i want to now show you this movie and this is a movie in an intact organism this is not like the movies i showed you earlier where we have painted and labeled marks one cup right? in a living animal it is like it speeded up so it's not quite real time and you see cargo moving from the cell body towards where it will get used you also see cargo moving back and you see that it's happily moving in both directions oh and you also saw oh god you also saw cargo which didn't move it's that okay you also see cargo that stall and doesn't move right so you see all of the things that you might predict if you have obstacles the cargo which is moving smoothly on the track and your cargo which is not moving the so setup to answer is very very attempted to ask a very simple question by painting different cargoes asking two cargoes of different kinds stop at the same location and the answer was yes we marked cargo one in green we mark cargo 2 in red and they all move around and sometimes both cargos were stopped right next to each other and that's where it looks yellow all right so that's like an auto rickshaw and a car present together and not being able to move at a certain location and you can see what that means in terms of traffic no i just showed you the cargo moving by direction you see cargo who by it ke both cargos move by it both in both red Okay, so what other things we can now paint? So we just as we can mark cargoes, we can also mark the obstacles. So we take these street vendors and we mark them. They essentially, the street vendors, these little green things, except you mark them here in red, and you can see that sometimes this cargo is stopped right at the street vendor, close to it, not anywhere near, and doesn't care because there are no obstacles in that place. Right? So you see all versions of things as you would see if you, you know somebody is walking through these doors. And this is exactly again another example of taking such a thing. Except here, what we do is we take look from the top, look at things moving. So think of us as flying in a helicopter and taking a video. You see that these are the cargo which are moving. These are the street vendors. Some of the street vendors move for a little while, then come back and do things of that nature. but they're not going very far maybe the sun was beating down on them and then what you see is these cargo come some of them stop some of them don't seem to care some of them start from there and go away so you see various types of activities as you might predict if you see right around you in your daily life to summarize this section what i told you was the following you have roads that have ends they have ends you know things are coming they will reach one end things are going well they'll reach the other end so you have ends where there is no road anymore think of it as a giant pothole where a decision needs to be taken as to what to do you have these little street vendors present in various places and what i haven't shown you is that the neuron itself can be like the overbridge narrower or short okay in these things what happens what we have shown is that cargo gets stuck at the ends of neurons different kinds of cargo just together the auto rickshaw and the truck car and the something else they also get stuck at ends of roads they also get stuck where street vendors are present now it's something called accidents in the track the roads are made by my students in case you have already heard of them and here is the similarity that you can think about and this is a very for me as an indian very civilized traffic but you see how anybody disagree okay, good 
बट शोड अप ऑन यूट्यूब इज माय गॉड इसमें क्या है सब ठीक ही तो हो रहा है बट यू सी ऑल ऑफ द चॉइसिस One is trying to turn around. This is doing a U-turn and changing its direction. Right? All kinds of training with activity are not very different from neurons that we have within us. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So the question that arises is not a surprise that you have all these jams. The question that arises is what do you do? If you're a little cargo and you got stuck in a jam, can you do something, or are you jammed there for very long time till the first thing in the jam does something and move, or can you do something to bust out yourself from being stuck there forever, right? So we did that experiment using mathematical simulations with a theoretical physicist called Gaussian, who's in IMSC, and here are the results of the simulation. Those different balls. Are different colors and different types of cargo. You can't see easily here, but these cargo will stop at ends of the road, the ends of the multiple, and then just see what happens, right? Because what would you predict? What would you predict? You are driving, let's take a car, and you can see that there is a huge jam in front of you. What would you do? Somebody take a different route if possible. So that would require you to change direction. Anything else? First, you get an overview and try to. So, abey, you can't go in the helicopter. I think we can accept that. <laughs> I wish it was Batman style, but ain't happening, buddy. Yeah, that's what he said. Change direction, reverse. Yes. Get on the pavement. Get on the place where you know people are pedestrians are walking. That's awesome, right? What a solution. Hopefully, we don't kill it. Okay, so here we are looking at the pavement change, getting onto the pedestrian walkway analogy, or getting onto another track. Right? So just let's look at this. You have cargo that comes. Finally, if you cannot do anything, you don't stop. The last car is coming, 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 coming. coming. It will come and it will stop over here because it can't do anything. That means that if a vehicle is moving in a certain direction, it can only go in that direction. But if you allow the vehicle To get on to another track, it can clear the traffic jam. Okay, if you allow the vehicle or the cargo to change its direction and go back and try again, perhaps on another track, it will help. Okay. Is it cargo has the ability to tell what it is monster? No, no, no. The cargo is attached to a motor. I haven't given you all these details. Uh, I have prepared a 20 minutes also. There is no intelligence, so it. It's not <laughs> cargo has both kinds of engines on it. The engines which will take it to one direction or the other direction. So, are you what you're asking is is there some integration of signal locally that happens which decides whether it will do A or B? We don't know that yet. We don't actually know. Even though we see this phenomena, we think that motors are involved. They certainly the executors. We don't know if something else is doing it. Okay. So we are at the limits of what we know right now in terms of the field. How is energy going to help? You can rev your engine all you want. Jaga nahi hai jaane. Why will you go? See, the analogy to roads really holds true, right? So what you really want is an ability to either hop and get onto the pavement, get onto another road, or to go back and see whether you can, you know, try again. Try again. So you go back for some distance, maybe do something else, come back and see that that local block is cleared, and then continue. That's either of those two things. I don't think any other solution is going to work. The cargo changes the track. Yes. It, 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 go, it can go to other roads. Yes, it can. So when it comes to the end of the road, what can it do? It can't be there permanently, right? So what happens to the cargo is it falls off eventually from that track, and because it has other kinds of motors on its surface, it can get onto another track. Okay, very close to the end, Arna. Okay, so the obstacle course in the brain, as I said, let me summarize. I'm literally at the end of my talk. You have various kinds of, you have ends of roads, the street vendors, and and you have multiple cargo that get stuck in such places. These are the solutions that moving cargo can take. First, you are walking on another road, and you are rubber making all the people who are trucking say, I'm so glad I'm on this road. I decided I will not take that wonderful road, and I'm okay today. Right? So that's that example. This happily continues on, no problem. Another person comes and says, "My God, 
I'm coming close, let me get on to another room, right? So that would be one person comes and doesn't think and you know, I mean, he's just stuck. And then another cargo comes and says, all right, I'm going to go back. And then I come back after some time and see what happens, right? So the work which I presented today very briefly was done by my student Parul Sood who is here and a former postdoc Kalsalya. Um, all of my collaborations were done by, were, were done with Gautam Menon who is a theoretical physicist and these are all the grants that supported it. That's our worm logo made by another land member. And our worm, worm logo. There's a lot more exciting stuff to come. Get a quick break of time.